All right, so today our just a conversation between uh, Hugh and Mike, and um, I posed to Hugh kind of a, it's a conversation topic, and it's something that's been on my mind and something that Hugh's talked about uh, in the last few meetings, and uh, it's related also to his video on the rightness is all. So uh, my conversation today, we'll see how it goes, would be about developing a bloody-minded attitude and how it's related to the ripeness is all. And the way I've seen it and uh, in my, my experience is um, making small, bold decisions um, every day just to see how that changes you in some way. Because lately I've seen, especially living in, in a city, that um, humans, we've become domesticated and we relied on safety, security, of being decent to one another. And while it's given us, uh, you know, for the most part, we've we've been able to work well with each other. Uh, it's, it's amazing how people are able to live in such compact areas and be nice to each other. And when you go out in the wild, if people, or I'm sorry, not people, uh, chimps, other animals are, are too close. And if they don't know each other, they'll, uh, it's not a pretty picture, but uh, with that said, it's it's interesting how humans evolved over the years. And while it's given us that, the capacity to, to work with each other in offices, um, in supermarkets, just it's given us, it's been, the drawback is that uh, it's leading us towards, uh, I will have I've seen it's totalitarianism. We we need IDs to drive cars. We need passports to travel. Uh, less freedom, less uh, I guess mobility. We we're, we're stuck in traps. So the way I've seen it is developing a bloody-minded attitude. It's it, it's a way to step out of that, um, even even little by little, just to see that there's a difference between being safe and secure versus free and uh yeah that uh you have anything to say about that Hugh? yeah i feel a need to just make the distinction of you know if you say a bloody minded attitude i think people might think oh you must be an arsehole then no being an arsehole is not what i mean it's it's actually better from a strategic point of view to have a bloody minded and defined attitude but a very you know, not false, but uh, a civil and amenable persona. So it's you know, the idea, idea is that it's for for decision making uh, and that kind of thing. Um, then the fortune favors the bold. And if see a lot of people are playing it safe. A lot of the, the the average person is trying not to get hurt and play it safe, but they're not doing themselves much of a favor because, in my experience. They, they cut themselves off from you know serendipity and opportunity. And so they continually despise people that think, why is everybody so much luckier than I am? <laughs> it's because they're not trying to play it safe. They, so I, extend yourself and be bold and brave. The rewards are ridiculously high. They, they're just a little bit of putting yourself out there outside your comfort zone taking on a bit of risk. The returns are so high, it's, it's always amazed me. It's, you know, it's, uh, so I, I've always been very wary of, of hunkering down and playing it safe because it, it doesn't, um, it, it's, a, it's kind of closed and there's not a good strategy to navigate change and, um, and chaos. So there's, you know, it's in the minds of most people, I think they're thinking, Here's order and safety, and here's chaos and risk. And it's not that way at all, because a chaotic region has as much opportunity as risk. But overall, it has a lot more opportunity. A safe, uh, a safe environment is um, its unlikely to have any opportunity. Slaves don't get opportunity, right? <laughs> so uh, if you just conform with the system, the, you know, luck doesn't come your way. Slaves never get lucky. 
they they get predictable, but you know you're getting the opportunistic version of gruel. You know you're getting fed a a life of uh, of awful, um, and so yeah, I, I feel that that very strongly. And I think uh, it's it's relevant to us because we've had it bred out of us. So they've spent a long time domesticating us, and you know we we are domesticates. Even our jaws, our faces are evolved to be amenable. We, you know, we we as domesticated as a domestic dog or, or cow or anything like that. So it, there's there's a price to pay for that. You know? So um, in, in terms of when things get get chaotic, yeah. So. So it's not about being an arsehole. It's just about really being being bold and resilient. So you don't go, oh, you know, we're defeated. Oh, you know, what can we do? Oh, resistance is futile. I mean, that you have a, a culture of resistance in yourself. You have a mindset of resistance. So it doesn't mean that you go out and make dramatic stands. It just means that, in, for example, I, <coughs> in... Um, there's an experiment they do um, in terms of of uh, group cohesion and group thing, a psychological one. And what, how it works is they put people all in a room, and they put uh, they give them a task, leave them alone, and then they start putting smoke under the door. Then, for most people, they uh, won't do anything if nobody else does. So all the they have one test subject, and all the rest are actors. And if all the, you know, if the, the test subject goes, oh, shit, there's smoke coming into the door. And if everybody just carries on with the task and says, like, yeah, it's like, so what? The, the vast majority of people will go with the group, even though, you know, the building could be on fire. And when they put the, the, the people in alone in the room, they immediately, you know, run to open the door or do something. And so there's very few people, maybe one in 20, that will be in the group and say, like, screw this, man. These guys are crazy. This, this, you know, the place is on fire, guys. Get out. <coughs> and so you must be that one in 20 guy. The 19 that go, like, well, no one else is doing anything. I'll do what they do. It's like, <coughs> what, whatever the group does is not going to go well, right? The, the group is going to, um, because, because we're domesticates, you think? So the sheep are, are generally, they're going to come, you know, they're going to make mutton out of them. So, so always, always try and break away from, from the herd. Because the herd is going to get slaughtered soon. That's, that's what's coming. Yeah, so, yeah, so, in a, so in a, and naturally I'm a contrarian. So if you say something like, oh, you know, like going, going to Japan or something, you say like, well, it, yeah, but aren't we about to go to war with China and stuff? Say, yeah, but it's like you're not burning any bridges or anything going to Japan. So, you you know, you can get on a plane and leave. <laughs> but you see, the fact that most people think down a certain avenue means that all the gravy to be had is probably down that, that avenue. You, know, you should always ch challenge people's thinking because, you know, it's like, it's like now, it's in, say, in Britain. You would say you wouldn't become a truck driver now because you'd say, well, you know, Everything's about to be automated. We're going to have self-driving cars and, you know, it's a shit job and stuff. And it's like, no, because everybody thinks that, go and do that because you'll probably be the only driver and you'll find out there'll be no, you know, automated cars or anything like that. <laughs> and you'll find it's the best job known to man. Soon people are going like, how do you get to be a, a truck driver? And oh, you can't get in now. Oh, it's too late. We all unionized and the richest guys in Britain. So you see, it pays to be contrarian, man, is, is what I'm saying. So that's, I always, I always say by, by temperament and, and philosophy, that's always what I advise, you know. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, lately, I've I've learned to that it's best, especially given the time we're in, to disrupt the the status quo. I mean, the the tech industry always talk about disruption, and they use it in a weird way. But I mean, disruption ultimately uh, leading to uh, in you know involuntary uh, 
dismantling of the industrialized civilization. But that that doesn't happen in one day. It, you know, all all these types of activities it takes it takes small incremental, it, like a chink in the armor that eventually grows and uh, also like a virus. It it starts. Uh, you know, it, just one virus can can disrupt the whole human body. So uh, taking that philosophy. So, yeah, um, but also in addition to that, I mean, a lot of people, uh, John Taylor Gott, Gatto, in regards to education, says um, we, it, the point of education is to create a predictable, homogenous product. And if people who go to school, once they leave school, their, their uh, options are limited to office work or uh, they can't really do so much. They're, they're limited to one industry. Or oh. somebody, or, or go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, finish your thought, but I've got a, I've got okay. a good one to you say here. Yeah, yeah. My, I just wanted to finish up saying, yeah, yeah. So, with regards to what Gato had to say, it's it's interesting that uh, schooling, the the system that that's built, the whole uh, education system, that's uh, compared to, let's say, somebody who learns just getting input um and i think you, you you'll talk about this story but there's people who went off to see who, who weren't part of the education system they they became polyglots they learned math much quickly more, uh, more quickly they learned they were just more learned compared to somebody who went through the the uh, strict education system but yeah go ahead yeah so I just wanted to highlight what the cost of going through the John Taylor Gatto system is um, in terms of, um, for, for example, neurologists will tell you that uh, in particularly um, with regard to plasticity of the brain. So plasticity of the brain is now the big thing and it's continually amazing scientists about exactly how plastic the brain is and it's kind of a mystery because we've for a number of decades we've had this idea that the brain's kind of a computer and you know, we've had these continual assaults uh, about the brain and the, the you know mysteries because you know we, the first one was in 2001 when the hum, human genome was sequenced and there were only 27,000 uh, genes and the, you know the, they thought like well how, how does that work you know you you've only got about 50 billion base pairs and you say, like, well, you've got 50 billion neurons. So how do you specify a map, you know, a blueprint of the brain when you've got, you know, you can't have one, <laughs> one base pair for one neuron. How does it do it? And the, the thing is uh, really self-organization. But now, if you think of, like, supervised organization, what John Taylor Gatto is talking about, in school, that's supervised organization, supervised learning. It's quite different to plastic learning and the learning you're talking about. And it has dramatic effects. One of them, I mean, they're so striking that, listen to this, that the uh, hunter-gatherers and wild people, the people that are closer to our natural state, they don't get Alzheimer. They, they don't get um, these uh, neurodegenerative diseases. They don't get senile. So they they can do in some, but they generally, uh, you know, subsistence farmers or something. They're basically um, kind of agriculturalists or pastor, pastoralists. But uh, you know, and I think traditionally the Raymond Darts and stuff of this world, the, you know, the kind of hard uh, evolutionists, anthropologists would have said, well, that's because it's a harsh environment and those guys would be killed off if they were seen. You know, it's very Asked to old people, but it's 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 not at all that. What they've there's a, a recent study, fairly recent, which was called this. It's I think it's known as the Nun study, and they did this um, these tests on all these nuns who lived in a convent, and you you know you would think that um, you know it would be kind of a normal life or or have the same instances of. Alzheimer's disease and these kind of things, and they didn't. Not one of them had Alzheimer's disease. And when they looked at their brain scans, they saw that a good proportion of them 
had Alzheimer's, but it was never diagnosed. They showed no symptoms. And they were kind of baffled, is how can these, some of these nuns have severe Alzheimer's and have no, um, you know, sh shown on their brain scans and uh, EEGs, but they showed no symptoms. They weren't impaired. Nobody ever said, you know, somebody's just a little bit funny in there. And they eventually found it's plasticity of the brain, as those nuns had a very interesting life. They were kind of like the rats in this, you know, you know, uh, rat, rat city, you know, utopian city where everything's interesting. And so that was the secret, it was plasticity of the brain. So now we've got an e epidemic of Alzheimer's and all these neurodegenerative domestication. But nobody is saying, well, there's something wrong with our environment. They're saying, well, we must find new drugs for Alzheimer's and stuff. And it's on the, and it's like, guys, fuck the drugs. You, you need to basically have environments that are, have, are conducive to plasticity of the brain. So it, it's very easy. You can start learning new languages. You can start going to new countries. All of those literally give you another 10 years of life. Um, so what, what's happening with, <laughs> it's, it's almost a joke because I keep on talking about Kronos and Kairos and how these, these Vogons are kind of, they, they're trying to get certainty and that's too crystalline, right? It's too brittle. It's, you know, it's, it's regular like a crystal. It's, it's regular, but it's rigid. It's brittle. It'll, it'll break. It's, it's kind of like a pillar of salt, right? It's, you know, it's, like, it's like stone. And it's dead. And so that's what this, you know, kind of Kronos world is trying to, it's this dead stone world that's literally representative by a crystal. Now it's so ironic because that plasticity of the brain, what's happening with Alzheimer's is you're getting calcets. Calcium is the way that it's literally stone. <laughs> it's, li it's literally a, a accretion of, of stone. So they are literally turning to stone with this chronological life and so you know it's so it's uh living with chronos and variety and novelty and um uh is is literally breaking up the the the, the stone in your in your brain the crystals in your brain and making them more fluid yeah. but yeah brain plasticity and stuff is uh so damned important and, and, and you know the way to get brain plasticity is to get life plasticity <laughs> stop living in cotton wool wow that that really puts everything into perspective because uh i've been fascinated with uh, brain plasticity and um for this time actually and all these um seen neurologists talk about oh if you study a new language that can uh, put uh, years off of the Alzheimer's. They see Alzheimer's at a later age, or they talk about exercise. They talk about specific things, but I, I don't see anyone putting it together, like how you, you've done it well right now. It's uh, life plasticity, just doing variety of things, uh, not uh, out of the norm, learning a different language, living in another country, that, that yeah, yeah. But, but but look where we look where we're going and where the transhumanists are going. So you can see that what's important is is life and plasticity of the brain. And what the guys like transhumanists like Elon Musk are talking about is you know human augmentation, particularly brain augmentation. And they're talking about silicon. Silicon is a crystal. It's you know SI. It's uh, it, it is a crystal that's kind of a neighbor of carbon. And it's, so they literally thinking of enhancing humans by putting crystalline chronological stuff in the brain. Well, you know, you're diminishing a human. Any, anybody that says, no, I don't want to turn to stone. I want to, I want to be organic and living. You're always going to beat an Elon Musk that has a, has a cell implant. Because, you know, even if it just takes up real estate in, or, or trickles over, it, it's still uh, just a box that's kind of like a boat anchor because it's you know, chronological. It has 
a certain kind of uh, step procedural kind of way of working with the alien cortex. It's literally the alien cortex um, kind of enhanced. But the, the alien cortex is kind, of, is kind of like a break on, on your intelligence. It's not really <laughs> where your intelligence is. It'll tell you it is, but it's a liar. So the real intelligence is everything that's happening underneath. And it must be, um, by definition, because of what I just said about the fact that the, the genes can't be a blueprint that way. What, so how does the brain organize? And it's like, it's self-organizing. And so the remarkable thing about brain plasticity is how self-organizing it is. And part of the, the thing that's amazing is people that lose a limb, for example, they, um, or if you say lost your hearing or, you know, uh, went blind, uh, the, all the parts of your brain that are dedicated to processing uh, visual input, uh, you know, if, if you're talking about sight, um, if you go blind, they very, very quickly get repurposed into, you know, the rest of your brain. That's why blind people, are, you know, uh, are known to have super hearing and deaf people, you know, have super visual acuity and all that. It's, it's because, uh, and also if you lose a limb. So if you, if you say lose your left, left arm, uh, it, a good part of your brain, I think this right away, if you put an Alice band over your head, right, that is where your, your body is represented. What that part that represents your missing arm, it quickly gets taken over by something else, so that something else, like your your skin or some some other thing, will use it. And you say, well, how can it be? How does it know? You know, why doesn't that happen normally? Why why isn't you know you have your your arm, and it's like why doesn't it get taken over accidentally? You know, just and during the course of the day, oh. I lost connection to my arm. Why? Oh, some tyrant bit of my brain took over that bit and now I can't control it. And that never happens. And so there's deep clues into what a brain is and what it's doing. But in general, it's, uh, it's tightly integrated with its environment. That's why this idea that you can have black box um, AI and have it intelligent is, is retarded. It's just fucking idiotic. And so the only way a Turing test works is, is you, you, know, you just have to narrowly restrict how you can communicate with the black box. You have to do it by teletype or something. But I mean, nobody would be fooled by, by a robot because you would quickly walk up to it, tap it on its head and say like, this is a fucking machine. It's, it, there's no, you know, the Turing test is, is mystical because to some geeks because it's it's so re restricted. How does the thing know how to speak lectically correctly? And it's like, yeah, but yeah, if you if you shut down the communication channel to such a narrow bandwidth, then sure you can fool a per person because they're looking at it through a straw and you don't know what's at the other side. But in general, we're engaging with other people with the you know the full bandwidth, and it's much much bigger than you know the little teletype or telegraph or keyboard that you use to you know commun communicate with ai so so we have a hundred percent interface and then you we're continually engaging with other people so not only self-organizing within itself it is taking cues from other people and the stuff around you and and so they also imparting some org organization into it and that's the key to how you know babies progress so fast Ba babies can learn language and stuff amazingly fast. And you think, how is this happening? There's no blueprint to lay down the architect of a, br a brain, right? But they're learning all these skills. They're learning grammar and stuff, just learning on their own. And they say, why? And so th there's implied organization all around. So by exploration, then you are self-organized. Now, at some stage, to make a slave culture that we have, we stop people exploring. You see, the very as soon as kids go into school, they stop them exploring. The you know the kids the very first thing they do is say, Johnny, Johnny, come over here, get out of the corner. What are you doing in the corner? Come over here. We're doing dinosaurs, Johnny. We're doing dinosaurs. And it's like you're stopping the kids' exploration. After he does dinosaurs, the whole class has done dinosaurs. 
dinosaurs do not they organize everybody but they don't organize them intelligently they organize them around this concept of fucking you know very narrow idea of dinosaurs in fact it's it's a it's a myth of dinosaurs right but then they teach the kid about Dinosaurs, like, those are not what dinosaurs, what we teach kids in kindergarten about dinosaurs that they get enthusiastic about is Barney is not a dinosaur, right? What, whatever dinosaurs are, they're not what we're teaching kids in school. So we're not imparting knowledge. We're just basically imparting this kind of rigid rote learning and stopping the exploration. And that is really what John Telegato was saying, is that schools are there to stop your exploration, to regiment you, and get your condition to the clock. And then when you do that, then you predictable, then then you are the, the product, you, you are the source. So they say now, oh, you know, social media, they, you know, if you're not getting, you know, what do they say, then, you know, if, if you can't, uh, if you're not paying for the service, then you're the product or something like that. It's like, you're always the product because when you're interfacing the machine, that's what they're doing is no matter what you do, you'll be the product because it's uh, you regular, reliable, and predictable. And as soon as you regular, reliable, and predictable, something will predate on you. So, so, there's, so this is another thing about plasticity of, of the brain, is it makes you unpredictable, makes you uncontrollable. <laughs> and so it, makes a, it reduces people pred being a predator on you. So that's why Elon Musk is so wrong, because he said one day we will be the pet of AI. Unless we get slick and chips and neural nets plugged into our brain, we won't be able to compete. Absolute twaddle. Absolute twaddle. It's actually the opposite way around. Because, um, you know, they won't... Uh, AI, a machine could never keep us as a pet because we're just too fucking devious. We just, <laughs> we're just too clever. And machines are just too rote linear and procedural. So it's, uh, it's funny how we live in this fucking upside down world. Terrible, terrible. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. sorry, right. I've been talking for a long time, but I, no. I, I just, it's such, so fascinating to me, this whole subject. Oh, no, it's great. It's great. I mean, I'm just here to ask questions and um, hear your um, what you have to say. It's been fascinating. Um, I just would like to comment that, um, yeah, I mean, when AI and, and computers, it, it, they force a result. I just wrote that down. And unlike um, in nature and humans, if something breaks down, it doesn't repurpose it. More than likely, you'd have to chuck it away. Use it's so bad at recycling. I mean, there's so many issues with it, and it relies on a power source that that needs to that comes from the earth, right? Um, electricity. It's pretty much sucking the life out of the planet compared to um, humans and uh, other organisms. Um, our energy is shared and repurposed um it just it's as if uh by i mean it's hard to explain how it's possible but with with ai and machines it you you know okay it relies on this power source and without it it's uh it can't go go on compared to uh natural organic organisms we, we can't even explain how it's possible to it goes through the cycles uh, very well so it, it's great that you talked about that yeah well yeah so so one of the things that economists will tell you is they say this is according to upside down world now and economists are the best to elucidate on upside down world but they they will tell you well you know in hunter gatherer times things were boring because all you could do was like hunting or gathering. You know, even in that movie, BC or something with um, Will Ferrell, they said like, they're like, I'm not very good at hunting and gathering. He said like, uh, well, that's all we do is we're hunter gatherers. So it's like, we do hunting or gathering. If you're not very good at those, you know, you go. And, it, and economists, it's very funny when Will Ferrell says it, but economists really do say something very similar. I've heard people say that, well, this modern industrial life is much better. It's much richer because now you can be anything you want. You've got a, thousands of professions to choose from and stuff. And, you know, before you could be a hunter. Or, <laughs> it's like, it was like, come on, you can't be this stupid, surely. You only get to choose, you know, 
one career path. You, you used to be able to, in the 70s and 80s, you used to be able to change career careers. In, in, you know, people used to change about four times would often change career paths. Those days are well over. And then so, so, you know, now as things get more and more specialized and more and more um, complex, like economists are saying makes them the world interesting, it gets more and more boring because you only have one career, you make one chance, and then you go into it kind of blind. You know, you think, I like science and I like biology because I like animals. And when you go into the become a biologist, you find you sit in the cubicle working in front of a screen and your whole life is writing grant proposals and you never get to do the chemistry experiments that you loved in school that set you on that career path. So so everybody is bound into normally this this life, lifetime of routine where they go into work, they sit in a cubicle, they do this boring job that wasn't what they planned, and they have no... Um, no novelty uh, and and this dreadful grind that hunter gatherers never had. The life of a hunter gatherer is full of delight. It's full of new stuff and experience and laughter and you know and tragedy and stuff. It's you know every single day you don't know what's gonna you know you know rumors a tiger's just moved into the valley and then you know somebody has an encounter with a tiger and. It's, it's rich and full with stuff that you, you're never going to get in an office cubicle. And so your whole day is like swallows and Amazons and finding other tribes and seeing new things. And so it's, it's just playtime. It's, it's kind of like playtime for kids being a hunter gatherer. And um, they spend endless amounts of time chatting and laughing and joking like people do in the pub if they're given free time. And, Hunter-gatherers' life is so much richer, and that's why they don't get Alzheimer's disease because they have this world of um, novelty and plasticity of the brain. So it's a very rich world, and so what we've done now is our world is actually impoverished and getting more so as it gets more sophisticated because you have a narrow and narrow field. So even if now you go into physics, you know when when Einstein did physics. It was an open field. You, as an individual, you could publish a paper and it could become world famous and you could get a Nobel Prize for it. Now, a lot of scientific papers in physics, they have 2,000 authors on them that you, you never can ever, you know, even, the, even like Higgs and stuff, though, even the days of Higgs writing a paper where, where they find the Higgs boson and he gets a, a Nobel Prize, that's gone. So, uh, so, yeah, so, so what I'm saying is everything gets very narrow and uh, very predictable and everybody becomes more and more granular, more and more of a smaller cog in this bigger machine. And so, no, as we get more stuff, our life is degrading. Although economists say, look at the GDP, look at the standard of living. But if you take the standard of living as how much our brain is wiring up, our standard of living is deteriorating now. So living is when your neural life, your, your intellectual life, the life we really lead, the Kairos life, is all about neural connections. It's all about making connections. And, so, you know, basically neurons firing and wiring. And that's, that's what makes a rich life. So economists have to stop talking about the GDP and says, is the average person's brain firing and wiring? <laughs> and, uh, and so... Yeah, you know, not even measures of happiness. Measures of happiness are very, very wrong because it's just you know pleasure and pain. And it, it, you know, happiness lasts for you know whenever you got your last blowjob is about as long. <laughs> you, you, you go get a massage with a happy ending. That's you're happy for how long? Five minutes. <laughs> so happiness doesn't extend to like are you generally happy? Check the box, left or right. Well, you're asking the alien cortex. Is this is the slave happy? And the alien cortex says, yes, I, I command him to be happy. <laughs> so the alien cortex checks the box saying happy. And they say, well, by measures of happiness, this is a very happy country. For some reason, everybody's committing suicide and alcoholic. But when they asked, are you happy? They check the box. And it's like, guys, you can't be this stupid. Surely you can't be this stupid. But so anyway, you can't have GDP, you can't have measures of happiness. You, you know, you have to have things of how rich your life is. And it's sort of like, the neurologists will tell you, 
is this chimp getting Alzheimer's and degenerating, getting senile by the day, or is it wiring up new brain cells all the time? You know, this brain has a is a Hebbian swamp of firing and wiring and stuff. And so, yeah. So, I, but okay, I'll shut up now. But the the one of the things that is implied is as the world goes to shit, everybody will be bemoaning. Oh, there's unrest on the streets. There's violence. There's disruption. There's nothing is certain. GDP is going down. And you say like, yeah, but look at the guy's brains. If you put people in a brain scan, they're wiring up their brains like crazy. <laughs> so this is the best time in the world. It, okay, I'll say one more thing and then shut up. If you could do a brain scan of people during the Pax Romana, in other words, when Rome had an empire, and everybody said, well, this was a fabulous time because it was a time of peace imposed by the Roman legionaries. It was a time of peace because they'd basically beaten everybody. And uh, everybody was defeated. So now we're supposed to believe that was a wonderful time of literacy. And well, of course, it's literacy because it's alien court. But you say, like, what, what was happening in the people? They were decaying. And then you say, uh, then came the Dark Ages. Well, I'll bet you if you did a brain scan of the average Roman citizen at the peak of Rome and the average, say, peasant in the time of the Dark Ages, the peasant would have a better brain scan and have a more better EEG and they'd be you know, wiring up more brain cells <laughs> because his life is more interesting. Right? It's, it's, it's more quite chaotic, it's more dangerous, but it's more interesting. And uh, you don't get much intellectualism. So you don't get you know, Steven Pinker saying, but in the dark ages, literacy fell and you say, yeah. And the rest of the brain got a reprieve from this tyrant in Steven Pinker's head. <laughs> Am I talking bullshit or does this all make sense? No, just, to me, it's, it's you know, once, once you say it, it's like so fucking obvious <laughs> that I don't see anybody can argue. <laughs> maybe I'm just kidding myself. <laughs> no, it's I'm just absorbing it because I'm, I mean I, I don't hear this too often, so it's it's good to hear. I mean I try to live live it, and sometimes I don't know how to um, communicate it. Or even say it as eloquently as you do, but yeah, it's 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 a lot. Um, my only comment would be, yeah. So living a Kairos life, um, a lot of people, um, you know, from the upside down world point point of view and the Chronos life, they they say, oh no, don't don't take that risk. Don't uh, move out of the country. Don't go out to sea. Don't um, go uh, be a sustainable farmer because of so and so reason you how about your your security your job security where are you gonna get your so food supply from where how about your health insurance and then they, they talk about a lot of these chronos related um or chronos uh, uh things right chronos supported these you know the health industry the uh jobs it's it's all chronos like why aren't you supporting chronos anymore that's how i i interpret that converse or that statement i mean I, they do care but they're still trying to say hey you're, you're gonna lose out on chronos what's kairos like and i feel like that's the con that's how the conversation's been in, in cities they want they only know chronos like they don't know or understand or even talk know how to talk about kairos yeah you see the problem is that you we're talking to slaves here. So we're talking about slaves. So a, a slave will always tell you the wrong risk-reward risk ratio. So if you see like the Wolf of Wall Street uh, is not a slave. And he has a much closer idea about risk-reward ratios. So he knows that you know, the risk-reward ratio is heavily bent in favor of risk. Like gamblers know it. So you don't want to gamble in the casino because ga gamblers that gamble in the casino are not uh, unpredictable. They're actually very predictable. So in other words, only slaves gamble in the casino. Only slaves go to Vegas. Right? And so the, you know, the, the house is, uh, is putting all the risk onto them. And that's, that's what happens in a slave plantation. And that's what a government will do to you too. Because they... They've, and the corporation will do that to you too, is that 
they try to push the risk onto you. You say, I, I've considered um, in a career in, uh, in software. Is, is, you know, if you ha are assigned a task or project, um, they, the corporation will try and divest their risk and put it on the employee. And what, the way they do it is give you a deadline. They say, you know, if you, if you don't make this deadline, you'll be fired. And, uh, you know, and if, yeah. so, you know, it's like, it's not up to you whether the guys, uh, they give you the resources or anything like that, or, or what happens, the shit that happens in life, they're forcing you as, as the project manager to take that shit off their shoulders. And you say, look, I got a fixed salary. You bang me by the hour. I didn't sign an employee contact where I'd say you can you can shove your risk on me. So I I work by the hour like every other one on stiff that you're screwing, and and you are then getting a free bonus by a extending the hours that I work when, and uh, and two by shifting the weight that you you know you've got the enterprise you it's your risk capital. And they're saying, no, I have secure capital. I'm pushing my risk onto the employee. And so, so that, that's in general what, what, what's happening in the corporate environment. And, and in all of these environments, so a slave will tell you the wrong risk-reward ratio. They will always tell you, like, no, don't leave the plantation. Where are you going to be fed tonight? And what they're saying is, you, you're going to lose your regular rice bowl. And you say, what's the price of that regular rice bowl? It's the price of the world of the Wolf of Wall Street. So the Wolf of Wall Street can get, you know, can walk into millions, and, you know, be strolling down the street, hear a conversation, put two and two together, go and make an investment and become a billionaire overnight, right? Just look at George Soros. He, he made one of the greatest fortunes in, in human history. He could not have done it if, if basically he listened to his mom and said like, but, but Georgie, be responsible. Where's your bowl of rice going to come for tonight unless you just do a work -a day job? He said, no, I'm going to risk it all, <laughs> bring down the British government and uh, make one of the biggest fortunes. And then other people go, you know, he's so smart and he's so clever because why? Because he got, you know, he got lucky, but he didn't get lucky because of hard work. You see, the slave will tell you, if you work hard enough, you will get more rice at the end of the day. That's the deal the plantation gives you. So if you want to get ahead, then work harder. You can get up to two bowls of rice a day if you just keep on breaking your back. Uh, and so, you know, uh, but the, the George Soros will tell you, <laughs> if you're working for somebody else with two bowls of rice a day, um, you'll never get lucky. And so it's so it's, it's got nothing to do with talent and hard work. That's a slave story. It's got to do with luck. And where does the luck come? It comes from taking on risk. But unless I've spoken too much here, I'll t I must tell you something about risk. Here's, here's the kicker about risk, right? So what most of people are doing and with the social contract, with Hobbes' social contract, and <clears throat> why most of the middle class and the bourgeoisie and all these liberals, and that they opt for this shitty life in industrial society for very small payoff, you know. Oh, you got an iPhone. Well, your, your iPhone is is not enhancing your life. My, my son went to a concert the other day, lost his, lost his iPhone. He said the six days he didn't have an iPhone were fucking blissful. <laughs> so, you know, he's a 20-year-old. So, so, you know, you, you've been bought for a bowl of rice a day in terms of, you know, a, a car that you sit in in traffic and degrades your life for things in the shop, which, you know, are kind of poisoning you for an iPhone, which just makes tech, which makes your life hell. And then an Xbox and things that just degrade your time and make you feel like shit. And so they, that's your bowl of rice is all those small, small rewards like that. But here's the thing. What is the right amount of risk to take, right? So, so, okay, so think of it this way. The employee or the government, the state, and the citizen or the employee, the employer, or, or the employee citizen um, who's opting for this social deal, 
say, you know, both of them can be considered to be trying to get in the insurance business, business, insurance mitigation business, and pass their, their risk off to the other one. So you as a citizen try, try and pass your risk off to the government saying, you know, hey, when the comet comes in, when an, an army comes over the horizon or we have a pandemic, you're going to bail me out, right? And of course, the government says, yeah, of course we are. <laughs> like, horseshit, because they're only in the government to pass their risk of a comet coming in or something onto the people. So they, they, it's a zero-sum game where each one is trying to palm off the risk on the other one. So you say, okay, now here's the amazing thing. If you say, think of them as two insurance companies trying to build, build each other on insurance premium, say, which one win? Who, you know, is it the one that makes the rest, best risk bet or something like that? And say, no, if you look at all risk, uh, I'm going to go a while out on the limb here, is all risk is invalid, right? So, so in other words, the concept of risk is invalid. So the concept of risk comes from our alien cortex, right? And it's, it's trying to say, how, you know, how can I play this safe and avoid death? And so a quick way of saying is you can't avoid death. So nobody should be in the insurance business. But now nobody's going to buy that. So I'll try and explain it in more depth. Okay, think of it this way. If you're an insurance company and you, you, you okay, the very first bits of insurance were for ships. So they had these guys who took big risks for reward doing arbitration. They sent, they pulled their money into ships that then went to places like India and China, got these exotic goods like silk and spices. They came back and then, you know, you make it big because of arbitration. There's a big arbitrator. Nobody has silk in Spain and stuff like that. So you can charge a big premium. Now, why doesn't everybody do it? Well, for one thing is because they don't have the capital cost to buy a ship, but mainly because uh, of the risk appetite. It's risky to get in a ship and brave the weather, kairos. So the, the Greek word for uh, for weather is also <laughs> kairos, right? So, so you brave the weather to get to India, and then if you make it through and you don't wind up on a lee shore and you can, the winds are favorable and then the the crew doesn't mutiny and you don't get hit by pirates, then you make it big. Okay. So then some somewhere down the road, somebody combined this safety conscious uh, mindset with this acquisitive mindset. So they set like the reptilian brain, which is all do this high risk venture. The, an alien cortex came around and said, I will sell you insurance. Right. Are you okay? Like, yeah, you're oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I was just yeah, nodding okay. so, like, uh, wow, that's uh, so, <laughs> That's right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, so, okay, so, so then you see, so, so what happened was then these guys said, look, what we'll do is pull the risk. So we know how, you see, it was a clever trick because they say, look, we know how many ships leave from Amsterdam, you know, 300 leave every year. 10 of those are lost. So, so every year, there, there are 10 syndicates that go bust, and these poor guys go from being gentry to being poverty-stricken, and it's terrible. So why not? You know, there's so much reward in this trade. Why don't we just pool the risk? So then we all give a little bit to cover those 10 ships, and then we all share in the 90 ships that come back. And everybody nodded their head saying, well, this is brilliant. And this is the, the invention of insurance. So then everybody puts the, the premium into a pot. And then anybody that takes a loss takes it out of the pot. So it was a con game because the guy that came up with insurance realized that he, he's going to sell all these suckers insurance. So while it sounds superficially good, he's going to make out like a bandit. And the reason is he knows exactly the actuarial statistics. He knows that, you know, really, although it looks like 10 ships, it's not regularly 10. If it was regularly 10 ships, but he knows sometimes it's 20 and everybody freaks out. And then sometimes 
the, you know, it's like only one ship is lost. And then they'd say, well, that was a good year. And suddenly everybody gets into the trade. And so, you see, so what the insurance, the guy selling insurance is doing is he's saying, I can do a little trick here because I can keep better actuarial statistics. I've got an inside track. I know exactly how many ships are going to be lost. So I charge them more than the ships that are lost. And that's the, the money I make in the, um, in the insurance business. So I, I have a, I, I have a profit because the premiums outweigh the losses. That's the trick that insurance companies are doing. So you think, oh, this guy's a genius. No, he's not. He's a fucking idiot. And this is the reason. See? And I've, I've said this a number of times, and I, but nobody really understands. So I have to get better at saying this. You say, what's your yardstick for, for saying that you have better actuarial statistics than the next guy? So, so all insurance companies, when they compete with each other, they're competing with who can give the lowest premium. They only know who can give the lowest premium is, is who can define the risk best. So in other words, who has the most data on the risk? So they have who has the most certainty, right, predictability, compared to the other insurance company can give less of a risk, and then they get the business. Okay, so that's, that, that's how insurance companies compete. But now, how, what's the yardstick? You see, I gave the yardstick as years in Amsterdam for ships. But a year's arbitrary. So, so the guy selling insurance is an idiot because he's looking, he never gave it any thought. I'll tell you, I'm not done this for sure, but I'll bet you the first guy did it on each season, each year, and how many ships came by. But you see, what makes a year special? It's a chronological time. And it's saying, over this regular cycle, a year, I can predict Kronos. Well, you're an idiot because all insurance companies will go bust eventually to, may, to be viable on the short term. So, so how can I make a statement like this? Well, it's easy because most catastrophes are on a log-log scale. It means that they have Pareto distribution. So it means the size of the calamity is proportional to its rarity. Okay, does that make sense? So it's like at some stage you will have a year where none of the ships come back. It will be zero ships come back and everybody's wiped out and that's the end of the game. How often does that happen? Well, according to how big that calamity is, is how rare it is. So it's very rare, but it is there on a log-log basis, right, on a Pareto distribution. So on the long tail, it's basically it's a bell curve, and saying on the long tail is a small number of catastrophic events. And if you, if you don't believe me and you're listening to this and you think you some clever dick physicist and you know your statistics, you're full of shit. Because I can tell you that at some stage, the sun is going to explode and, <laughs> and basically take out the whole earth and your entire fleet will not be coming from India that year. So you, I can say with certainty that if you run the thing long enough, you will reach calamity. So you say, okay, okay, okay. But we're not giving insurance to ships all the way for a billion years until the sun explodes. And say, okay, well, what, what's, your, what's your yardstick? Here's the contentious thing I'm going to say. It's like, whatever your yardstick is, you are still gambling. So you, you haven't got away from risk. Because uh, the, at, <laughs> you see what I mean is, is on a bell curve, at some stage, while you're shooting and you, you think you're in the safe zone, you cannot, um, you cannot quantify over all lengths of time scale that, that you will not have uh, sufficient calamities to wipe you out. So an uh, easy way of saying that is saying that anybody in the insurance business is just waiting for a disaster that's big enough to wipe them out. So now this is a, now this might seem obvious when I say it, or or it might set your hair on fire if you're an economist. But the, but economists are thinking that and financiers are thinking you can hedge risk, and they're thinking you can hedge it indefinitely. But you can't for two reasons. One of them is you can't, you know, there's, there's no yardstick, there's no correct time frame to actually say these are the statistics. There's the average loss for a day. There's the average loss for a year. It's, you know, whatever you say works for, say, a year, 
I can always say, I'll just add years until you hit a bad one. So you're saying, it's another way of saying, any insurance company, Lloyd's, no matter what, they, they will eventually get wiped out yeah. if, if they take on proportionate risk. The way Lloyd's works is it doesn't take on risk. It takes on suckers and they have uh, syndicates and then they pass the they pass the, the risk onto the suckers. It's the same thing as corporations and states are doing. So they again in this fake business where they're faking people out. But but anyway, the point still holds that nobody should be in the insurance business because while well, they're thinking this is a brilliant idea because we're pooling Kairos risk, it's like, no, because Kairos risk is unquantifiable uh, in the long term. So at some stage, you're going to take a catastrophic hit that wipes out everybody. So, so in other words, do you see what I'm saying? Is you, you, you're only pushing by thinking that you're pooling the risk. You're only pushing the risk downstream, and you're not even doing that because how far downstream are you pushing it? You don't know. It, you might. The first day you set up your insurance company might be the day that you get the catastrophic event. So, so you don't know how far out it is. You, you have no way of going. So, even if you know the shape of the graph don't know when the calamity is going to hit you. So nobody should be in the insurance business. Now, that, now that's amazing because millions of people will graduate as economists and financiers and bankers. And stuff. And to hear some guy on a boat saying nobody should be in, insur in the insurance business, it's, it's like, I say, but it works. Say, so, no, it's worked so far because you're lucky. <laughs> it doesn't work in principle. So it's not mathematical. And if you like, you can take it all the way back to girdle and stuff like that <laughs> and really bury people. But but anyway, I hope I put across that this is an amazing result because here's everybody living a shitting life trying to be an insurance company. And I'm saying you can't do that. Look what's happened by everybody doing that. We've had, you, you've, we've had a 10,000-year... Uh, run in the insurance business, trying to build crops to insure ourselves against bad harvests and things like that. That's all agriculture is, is insurance. You, you say, look, I don't know if the wild berries are going to come out this year or, you know, the game is going to fuck off or the birds don't migrate. So, so you're saying, that's a little scary for me. So instead of taking that, what Kairos gives me, I'm going to try to take control. And so I'm going to cut a square piece out of the land and I'm going to till it myself and get control over the situation. Do you get control? No, you're in a worse state. Because now you need sun and you need the weather and you need the rains and you need the pests to stay away and armies not to raid you. You're in a much worse risk environment. right? And, and also you pin down, right? You can't move. You can't migrate away from your trouble. So, so in trying to control the risk with agriculture, you've actually increased your risk markedly. And, and then, uh, you know, you, you, the soil is just going to be from there, right? So, so your crop yields are going to reduce. So, so the one certainty you've got is that things are going to go to shit on you, <laughs> progressively worse. And you, you haven't done anything about the risk landscape. Um, you haven't actually mitigated it at all. And then... So, so farming is stupid. It's it's demonstrably stupid, and and all we're doing is farming. I mean, you know, Apple Corporation is farming its employees. Jeff Bezos is farming all the Amazon employees. The state is farming all its citizens. The oligarchs are far, farming all the people. Everybody's farming all the people. So, and farming, as you see, it's about about risk and and who passes risk. So, so this is a long-winded speech to say to you that. If you want to be free, you got to take on risk. That's what we need to learn as domesticates. So you got to give up the cage and go for the wild because the wild, you, you know that the wild is going to carry on at least until the sun bursts. But civilization is going to hit its ca catastrophic uh, meteor much sooner than that. So uh, again, uh, there, there again is another thing is like, you know, just NASA now is just doing an experiment to try and blow up some meteors and stuff. What they're trying to do, like meteors is a classic Kairos event. They're unpredictable, meteorites, stuff like that. So then they're going to do the same thing as they try and do with farming. 
is try and mitigate the risk. They're going to try, you know, steer these things away, try and actively intervene, get control of all these in whatever technology you use to get control. So how big are these things? Well, the, the very small ones and the very big ones, you won't be able to get control of. And say, well, how many big ones are? And you say, you can tell in advance. It's on a Pareto distribution. It's a log log rule. So say, say, I'll say, Earth will be taken out by a huge meteor at some stage. And you say, well, you know, when? And you say, well, the bigger it is, the longer it'll take to be, you know, the, the less often, not the longer it'll take, the less often they hit. So little ones will hit proportional to their size much more. So if, if I take anything, you know, say this asteroid is twice the size of Earth or something, or this, this interstellar object is twice the size of Earth, say how often is it going to hit? Well, can't tell you, but if you give me something that's a millionth times the size, I can tell you that the big object will hit a million times less than the small one. Or in other words, the small one will hit a million times more. So do you understand what NASA is doing? They, they're sending up a rocket say, to try and mitigate, get control of the sun. And you say, well, whatever one you get control of, you say, well, you know, then, you know, uh, that, that's, you know, the, you still have a bigger one at, at a proportional um, distribution of chance that will be there. So now you might think, well, at least we got the small ones. And you say, yeah, yeah but it's like you, you're deluding yourself because you don't know when the big one comes. So, so in other words, if NASA spent a, a trillion dollars defending against meteorites, you don't know that the big one comes tomorrow, in which case you wasted a million. You see what I mean? You see, it's not obvious because you think, but at least we're getting this bunch. <laughs> you're saying, yeah, but on what time scale? If you don't know when the big one hits, you don't know whether you are defending yourself against this pool that you think you have control of. So the, these are profound things because it goes to the heart of our society. Our society is built on these elements. And no one really talks about them or analyzes them. And we do incredible things like launch, you know, and, and people like NASA launching rockets to try and control meteorites. And we just take all these things as assumptions and say, these guys are rocket scientists. They're brilliant. And I say, no, they're thick as pig shit. Because they've, they've got the basics of like risk and reward and Kronos and Kairos. They, if you don't understand that, you, you, know, you've got, you know about as much physics as your dog. So we live in an you know, upside down world where all these people are incredibly stupid, are considered geniuses of vast proportion. And we, we look to their protection. So then the next thing you know, people are paying big taxes. So NASA can do stuff like save you from asteroids. But they're not. They don't know whether they're saving you from an asteroid. You, you might give away every penny you've got so that NASA can get everything up to the size of the Earth and deflect it. Could be tomorrow that the thing that's the size of the Earth plus two comes in. So... So, yeah, indeterminacy yeah. and determinacy are, are, <laughs> are, are crucial. And the, the thing is to say, like, man, go with Kairos. Just, just enjoy it comes. Don't sell out for safety. You, it's, it, it's illogical. Yeah. Am, I, am I making this point? Oh, no, clear? you are. Uh, I mean, I, I'm beginning to understand it more and more. And I think the more pressing, I mean, the, the NASA asteroid, one is that yeah, just doesn't make sense, but the one that's that uh, I think we should have more conversation on and is remote as scary as the geoengineering is another example of a, uh, them trying to hedge their risk. It, it's, oh, we want to control the weather now or control climate change. So, yeah, it it is closely related. You see, the the. Meteorite avoidance is is uh, is really space engineering, and geoengineering is exactly the same line of thought, and with with the same reasons why why it's not logical to do. But yeah, I mean, 
I kind of hope that, you know, somebody will eventually get what I'm saying. And, um, you know, it's, they're all very closely related. We wouldn't have embarked on this, on this exercise of civilization if, um, if we had a correct, if we were wise enough to understand the risk and risk mitigation. Because you would, you, our fundamental mistake was just not to, is to try and get something more than what the, the natural environment provided. Yeah, exactly. Right, so that, that's um, how we lost Eden. Yeah. 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 I think, um, did you have anything more to say here? Or I think that's great. Um, well, yeah, I, I, sorry I talked so much, but um, I kind of realized what the question Don't you were worry. asking was about risk and reward. Mm -hmm. So I hope, and you know, about you going to Japan. So although it wasn't personal, I hope I did answer on a personal level about yeah. the question that you would have asked, like maybe taking risk and going to Japan and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, it, it, I'll, I'll di digest it. And yeah, it hit, um, yeah, I, I'd like the conversation would be more um, general too, because um, I, I didn't really want it to be specific, but um, something that, yeah, it did hit me personally, but I hope it can um, touch other people or get the, yeah. I tried to answer your personal question um, in a general way. <laughs> yeah, that was good. That was good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, All right. Yeah. Fortune favors the bold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a good reminder. Yeah. All right. So I'll um, stop the recording from here then.